welcome to the second session of the panel breakout room. My name is Abigail Peterson. I am a certified crop advisor and director, or director of the agronomy um, department, I, I say. All right, here we jump to it. I'm pleased to introduce this session's speakers, Kelly Estes and Dr. Nick Sider. Kelly is an entomologist with the Illinois Natural History Survey at the University of Illinois. As the state ag pest survey coordinator, she coordinates trapping and surveys not only for economic and emerging field crop pest, but invasive species as well. She received her BS and master's degree in crop sciences from the University of Illinois. Dr. Sider is a field crop entomologist with the University of Illinois. He develops insect management recommendations for soybean and corn production in Illinois, has a PhD in entomology from Clemson University, his BS and master's degree in entomology from Purdue. Today, our presenters will recap soybean insect pest issues of 2023, including recent results of surveys for desic stem borer and potentially invasive soybean gall midge, as well as information on management of these insect pests. In addition, management recommendations and chemical control results for green, green clover worm and bean leaf beetle will be discussed. Before we get started, as a reminder, please use the microphones during the Q&A so others in the room and online can hear you. Let's welcome Nick and Kelly. Thanks for having us. I was just telling Nick, we really gave a lot of information back in October. <laughs> um, I drew the short straw and I get to go first. And um, honestly, Nick and I are pretty uh, easygoing and we can either talk with slides or we can have a true panel discussion. I do have lots of slides, not that I necessarily want to use them all. I, this is the problem. They gave us a deadline, and then last night I'm like, I don't like any of the slides I gave you. So um, my part in this is uh, recapping our state pest ag survey, and we do this every year in mid-July. This is one of the longest standing pest surveys, um, definitely in the Midwest, potentially in the United States as well. This um, goes all the way back um, easily into the 70s. Um, this is a survey we conduct every year in corn and soybeans. We do this um, in mid-July. We try to represent four to five counties out of every crop reporting district. And basically what that means is my interns drive randomly around the state. Um, as we hit selected counties, they um, find a soybean field with a cornfield next to it. We do 100 sweeps on the exterior, 100 sweeps on the interior. Then they go across to the cornfield. They move past the end rows and then they do a visual survey for western corn rootworm. And so a lot of what our goal is with this survey is to get an idea of pest pressures and pest populations that we're seeing in different areas of the state. This is a huge survey, and so this is why I don't like my slides. <laughs> it's a lot of information to present to you, um, either as one big slide that's really messy and busy, or I can break it down, and then I have 12 different slides. So um, I highlighted some of our more predominant soybean pests that we look for. And what I did was I gave you a couple years worth of information. So you can see just recently what some of the pest trends are. Um, this is a kind of a difficult uh, survey to in some ways pull information from. Obviously some of it is very straightforward. These are the pests that we're finding. But there's a lot of stuff that's um, hard to take into account. Because it is a random survey, we don't know any of the management practices that are going on. Um, you know, timing of when we do the survey versus when some of you are starting to spray uh, fungicides and insecticides. And that is a huge impact on what we're finding. Um, for instance, Japanese beetles is what we're starting with. And this past summer, we're out doing some of our other field crop pests and it's the beginning of July. And my interns come back from Macoupin County with um, counts of 300 beetles in 100 sweeps, huge numbers. And they're sending pictures from the field. This is crazy because they hadn't seen this yet. I'm like, that's great. This is beginning of July. We're gonna hit the 4th of July holiday. Be prepared when we get back. This is two weeks of intense survey. By the time we get back and start this survey, Planes are flying, everything's going. And so we're racing the clock, trying to get to different areas of the state before you do. So um, we look at some of our numbers of Japanese beetles and um, these numbers are actually pretty low. If you would 
go back into like 2018, 2019, those were numbers of over 300, 500 beetles um, in Western Illinois. So overall, pest densities of Japanese beetles were pretty low this year compared to many um, recent years. But what's interesting is that we get um, variability not only within the crop reporting district, but within each county. Oops. So if we look um, primarily here in the east central part of the state, and I'm just highlighting a couple counties that had maybe higher counts than what we saw in some of the other areas. And so we look at Ford County, you pull that out, and they were aver averaging 52 beetles per 100 sweeps. And so what that probably means is we had several locations in that county that had higher, but then we probably had a couple fields of zero, um, which drew that average down. You'll notice a trend as we go through um, some of these different pests that Coles, Cumberland, and Clark is where we saw higher pest densities of several, dif several different insect species. Um, you can stop me at any time if you have questions. I'm completely okay with that. Otherwise, I just get going. Um, we look at western corn rootworm. It's a pest that a lot of different people um, are interested in, not only in soybeans, but our counts in corn. Um, the past 10, 11 years, numbers have been pretty low. But what we are finding is that even though averages are really, really low, what we're finding is hot spots of um, higher western corn rootworms. And um, you will have a, a soybean field that's loaded down with westerns. You go five miles down the road and there's nothing. So management practices are playing a huge part in that, as well as potential um, spots of potential resistance. Um, and within our East Central region, Livingston, Ford, Iroquois, and Coles all had averages of, I believe, one to two to three beetles per 100 sweeps, which is actually pretty low, but higher than what we saw throughout the rest of the state. Not so much of uh, interest necessarily here in East Central Illinois, but um, in the Northwest and the West, even down in through some parts of central like McLean County, we pick up um, northerns, um, and actually quite a few northerns. Um, well, areas with continuous corn um, generally have a lot more northern corn rootworm. Interestingly enough, this year we, when we were doing the survey, counts were very low. And then as we were back in fields in August for some of our other work, um, northern corn rootworm populations were very high and we were getting um, calls about it, questions about it, and it actually just uh, gets a lot of hallway chatter uh, with Joe Spencer and I trying to figure out what's going on. And so um, more than likely um, some delayed emergence, potentially like maybe with the drought, um, just delayed some of that emergence with northerns this year. Bean leaf beetles, which I believe you're gonna talk about some of bean leaf beetle stuff. Something that we continue in the survey, although um, in general, it's very, um, we have very low numbers of bean leaf beetles. We tend to see higher bean leaf beetle numbers earlier in the spring, and then later again in the fall and September, but midsummer, we just really don't um, see a lot of those. And once again, and this is where that um, recurrence, Livingston, Coles, Cumberland, and Clark had higher um, than average numbers in this particular area. Stink bugs are um, something we get questions on every so often, uh, usually in some no-till situations, and usually earlier in the, in the spring. Um, but um, one, um, it's something that draws a lot of interest, particularly as um, for pod feeders. Two, we're also trying to keep um, uh, an eye on um, brown marmorated stink bug levels. As someone who does invasive species work, that's a newer invasive that um, is more of a nuisance pest in your house. So this winter, as you're seeing potentially stink bugs flying around in your house, those aren't your normal brown stink bugs, but brown marmorated stink bugs that are more of a threat out east, um, causing higher economic injury in soybeans there. Um, but it is something we are starting to pick up in soybean fields here. 
Um, so the question is, are we seeing damage from brown marmorated stink bugs? Um, not necessarily, not only in field crops, but potentially in orchards. So brown marmorated stink bug has a very large host range and is a huge threat um, to specialty crops. Um, we do see some injury levels um, in orchards, but they have such um, high management practices, so we're on scheduled sprays and things like that, um, that keeps that injury pretty low. Um, so they overwinter as adults, um, and they're just kind of hanging out in barns and houses um, underneath um, tree bark, things like that. And so early in the spring, um, as things start to warm up, as daylight increases, they begin their activity and move out. And so um, with orchards particularly, or even vineyards, um, the places most at risk are along tree lines because they'll move from their overwintering to tree lines and then to their preferred host crop. So I think there's probably some targeted spraying along those areas as well. Dectus stem borer is something that we are um, been interested in the past couple of years. Um, it hasn't always been involved or included in the survey, but something that has actually been around Illinois for quite some time. Um, we've seen it um, throughout the state and why we consider it more of an issue in southern Illinois. Um, we do get reports of it um, as far north as DeKalb County. Um, we've picked up in Pike and Adams counties. Um, but the highest populations are generally in the southern part of the state, and that's predominantly um, based on um, management of soybeans in that part of the state. So they tend to um, do better in no-till situations where there's more residue. And we're actually picking up um, quite a few adults in those areas. Um, over the past four years, um, Wayne, Hamilton, and Saline have been very big hotspots for Dectus stem borer. This year, we also picked up in Perry. Last year, um, Washington and Clinton counties also had quite a few Dectus stem borer in them as well. Um, and so it's just something we're interested in and continue to monitor populations um, here year after year. Nick's going to cover some clover worm and looper um, information here. Um, this is something that's also in the survey, and I group them together. We do actually separate counts, but um, of which one. Um, we tend to get more clover worm um, in this particular survey. And this is also a timing thing. Our survey indicated very few clover worm in mid July. But if you think back to last fall, come August and September, everybody wants to know what the black moths are flying around lights, um, along roadways, hitting your windshield. So um, we had a, a huge increase in population late in the season um, with green clover worm last year. And once again, Coles, Cumberland, Clark, and even Jasper had higher numbers. And I think probably this has mostly to do with we started our survey in in the um, southeast area. Um, we generally base that on um, who started planting first, um, uh, well, with pest development, uh, if it's warmer in the south first, we'll start there and then work our way to later planted stuff. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick. Thank you. Yeah, so um, any, any questions before we kind of continue on talking about, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of resistance. So I gave a talk this morning down in, in Collinsville. We spent most of the time talking about corn rootworm and resistance, and that's what I talk about more than probably anything else. And with, with both species, we've got resistance to all four BT proteins that are available in some areas. So most areas don't have resistance to all four of those in, in the same population. Some areas do. If you're up in DeKalb County, uh, you'll probably have a hard time killing corn rootworm just with BT traits. Uh, but it varies a lot depending on where you're at in the state. 
the, the corn on corn, like you mentioned, that's going to be the big driving factor. So like the more corn on corn we have in an area, the more of a resistance problem we have and the higher the numbers are, like the higher the numbers are coming out in the survey and in just reports from farmers. Um, and, y y you know, you can take that the other way too. Like the best thing you can do to break up your population is to rotate. One thing we don't see a lot of, uh, exactly like Kelly mentioned, is like the rotation resistant variant anymore, especially here in East Central Illinois. Our numbers in soybean, for the most part, low. Um, and it's kind of, in a lot of ways, gone back to what it used to be, where we really deal with this insect in a big way in these corn after corn areas, in areas like East Central Illinois, where we're almost exclusively rotated corn and soybean. We don't have much of a problem. Yeah. Any other any other questions? Talk a little bit about little bright moths, little brown moths. My colleague down in Tennessee used to call them DBMs. It was damn brown moth. If you asked him, if you asked him to identify one of those, that's what he'd call them. I, I don't know. It's brown moth. There's a lot of brown moths. Um, what we were seeing last year almost exclusively was green clover worm. And what was really kind of interesting, you know, this like a lot of moths where it can come in on wind patterns and that kind of thing. We saw them everywhere, like all the way from southern Illinois all the way up to northern Illinois. Uh, we had high populations of these moths. What we saw in, in soybeans from this, like in soybeans from these green clover worm was a lot more variable. This is an insect that I think most of us that deal with insect pests in soybean think of as kind of a wimp, like kind of a wimpy little pest, you know? They, they're very susceptible to diseases, uh, to a variety of parasitoids, and, and so you see these wild kind of boom and bust cycles with them. And I know like, I think it was two years ago, I, I get my ears confused now, so I think it was two years ago. I saw like five green cloverworm larvae the entire year. Like it was fewer than I've ever seen. I've worked in soybean, Indiana, South Carolina, Arkansas here. All of those states, there's green cloverworm in almost every field, but that wasn't the case necessarily in 2022, if I'm getting my ears right. If I'm not, I apologize. Last year we had quite a few of them. Um, and again, later on in the season, this time, again, with these moth pests that kind of can fly in from elsewhere, there's some variability on when they're really affecting us, depending on when those flights come through. A um, few things to note about green clover worm. I think most of you are probably aware of this, but just to reiterate, the moths are not a problem necessarily, per se. Like, they don't do any injury. Uh, they're sort of aggravating sometimes, but they, in and of themselves, they don't do anything. It's the larvae that are feeding on soybean foliage. And we did get some reports, and I, I talked about this down south, and I was almost kind of sorry I brought it up, because I, I asked people if they had heard about green clover worm feeding on pods, and they all looked at each other like, nah, we, we haven't heard of that. It's like, well, good, they don't, they don't feed on pods. Like, they don't feed on pods, they feed on foliage. But we got a few of those reports last year, and, and I suspect, what was going on uh, was either corn earworm, which does feed on soybean seeds. Uh, we don't see it as a pest in soybean terribly often through most of Illinois. Uh, down in Arkansas, where I used to be, this was the big pest. Like this was the, the one that we worried about the most in, in soybean. They'll feed on the seeds. Gr grasshoppers will do that as well. And with grasshoppers, it's almost always going to be on the edge of the field. You know, they don't really want to be out in a soybean field unless there's a lot of grass weeds or they got nothing else to feed on, um, right? So we don't really worry about pod feeding by grasshoppers very much, but they can do it, and it looks a lot like that. And it's right on the edge of the field where you're likely to see it. Corn earworm will do that. And we don't usually struggle with corn earworm and soybean in Illinois. We don't usually see very many of them, but it can happen. My instinct is that someone saw a little bit of this pod feeding from one of those two insects and attributed it to the fairly large numbers of green clover worm that we saw later on. So they were sort of coming in after the fact and taking the blame for that. That 
happens a lot with some of our insect pests, right? We don't always attribute that injury to the correct insect. And there's always insects out in soybean fields. So that would be my guess on that. If you never heard of green clover worm feeding on pods before, pretend I didn't say anything because they don't. Um, but if anybody tells you they got green clover worm feeding on pods, you can tell them, no, I, I, don't, I don't think that happened. I don't think that was what was going on. Um, but we do have some pod feeders. Okay, this last year we got um, green clover worm numbers high enough on our farms up here that we put out a little chemical trial. Uh, that was eventful for us. It doesn't happen very often. We, we sort of struggle to get good data on this insect because they tend to collapse, right? Uh, this particular trial was so exciting, I came off paternity leave to spray it. Uh, my wife was psyched. She was really, really happy that I did that. Um, so I, you know, I took a risk for these data, so just wanted you all to know that um, before we put them up. Um, yeah, I, I was the only one on the crew who had a license, so it had to be me. Um, one thing that was kind of interesting this last year, so usually with green clover worm, we think of this as an insect that is not very hard to kill, right? And, and these data would bear that out for the most part. We did get a little bit of a little bit of an odd thing here with Warrior. Um, we, we sort of struggled with Warrior to get good control of the green clover worm in this particular trial. That is not something we expect. You'll note there's a lot of variability there, right? Like that's what the size of that bar indicates, a lot of variability. Um, and I wouldn't point it out at all. I would have assumed that like I forgot to add that stuff into the tank or I mixed up the wrong rate or did something stupid. Not that I've ever done anything like that. Not in my trials, certainly. But we had bean leaf beetle in the same trial and as you'll see in a few minutes here, it, it did exactly what it's supposed to do on bean leaf beetle. This one report from the field doesn't mean a whole lot, right? We see a lot of variability with our efficacy, but something to keep an eye out on. And, and the reason, of course, Lambda is significant, uh, Warrior, is that's probably the most widely used uh, foliar insecticide um, in Illinois. Uh, again, I don't necessarily expect that's some sort of a long-standing problem, but a, an interesting observation we had in this particular trial. Everything else looked at what it was supposed to. It killed them. Um, we don't have to kill green clover worm too terribly often. Like, they don't justify an insecticide application very often. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the defoliation thresholds later, but soybean in general, and, and you all know this, tolerates defoliation really well, and that insect doesn't feed on pods. Bean leaf beetle, a um, little bit different because in some cases it will feed on the pods themselves, and we've seen a fair bit of that in this part of the state over the last several years. Uh, identification, I think most of you can probably identify this insect fairly well, but uh, that's a fairly good um, you know, picture of what you're looking for, which is that little black triangle behind. That little, we, we call that little structure there behind their head, the pronotum. Like right behind that, there's a black triangle that points to the back. It's your entomology trivia for the day, is the pronotum. Um, with bean leaf beetle, again, they defoliate. Um, the larvae feed on the roots and the nodules below ground. We don't really think about that very much. It doesn't really cause any harm. Um, the adults are feeding on the foliage. What's interesting about the adults, um, they're the first insect we see in soybean every year, and they're the last insect in a lot of ways that we see in soybean every year. It's actually that same generation, the, the overwintering generation, um, builds up in the fall, um, and then it'll come out of those overwintering sites in the spring. In the spring, that damage you see over there pretty cosmetic for the most part. Um, we don't worry a whole lot about that early season feeding. Vegetative soybean plants tolerate a lot of injury. If you're in a situation where you got bean pod model virus, uh, this is a vector for that. That can change that a little bit, but by and large, we don't think about that 
early season feeding very much. But what they'll do towards the end of the season is they'll build up on soybean before they overwinter. They feed on the leaves. That can be bad sometimes, uh, not very often. Again, we don't exceed our economic thresholds from defoliation too terribly often. They'll also scar up the pods. Now, one, one thing you'll notice there compared to that picture I showed earlier, they're feeding on the pod itself, and they're feeding on that green tissue. They're sort of running out of leaf tissue, and they're scraping away at that pod. They're not injuring the seed directly when they do that. What happens is that pod will dry down, and as it dries down, you'll get cracks uh, at those feeding sites. And that's what it then allows water in and pathogens in. And you get generally more of an impact on quality than on yield, though you can lose some yield from that as well. And in terms of the impact of this species, in Illinois, that is probably the larger impact uh, rather than the feeding on, on foliage itself. Um, bean leaf beetles for us are pretty easy to kill. We don't struggle to kill them if they're in the field when that application goes out. What, what's not going to work to control them is the, the practice that we very often do, which is sticking a pyrethroid in the tank at R3 because we were going across with a fungicide and hoping that that's going to kill bean leaf beetle a month later. It's, it's not going to do that. <laughs> um, it's not going to be there. It's going to be there for about five to seven days most of the time. Was there a question back there? Yeah, what's up? Yeah, yeah, the, the question was related to the timing of insecticide applications. Um, Adam pointed out that when you, you know, you spray at R3, uh, very often it's associated with a fungicide. If you were going to time uh, an application for an insecticide, what would be the best timing for that? And, y you know, in my mind, when you look across Illinois, our economic infestations of insects are fairly uncommon, but when we have them, they tend to be more at the, the later pod stage, it's like R5 and R6. When we have damaging populations of insects, that's when it tends to be. Now, does every field have a damaging insect population at R5, R6? No, no, not even close. Uh, it's a small minority of fields that have that. And it, it raises, again, a, a good point about insect control, which is, you know, a lot of times when we, when we talk about weed management, I mean, every field needs herbicide, right? Obviously, you can't not manage weeds in a field. When you manage diseases, um, we got our new plant pathologist back there, by the way. I'm looking at him right now, pointing at him, just, you know, there, that, that's for us. He, he'd be able to tell you, tell you better, but... With diseases, I feel like a lot of times they're trying to get more of a preventative, get it at kind of the beginning of that disease incidence, and perhaps they get a little more residual activity than we get with our insecticides. With insects, we don't get a lot of residual activity with most of those. So when you, when you try these preventative applications, you, you got to think about, okay, I'm preventing something, but when am I preventing it? And if you're using, especially like a, a generic pyrethroid, which is what, we're using most of the time if it's a just in the tank because it's going across the field type of application. You'd better be preventing something in the next five to seven days, you know, ten maybe. Uh, generally, that's why we recommend more of an IPM-based approach, more of scouting and treating according to need. That's part of the reason. Part of the reason is just we don't see damaging, like economically damaging incidents of insects all that often, um, especially in soybean. One, one thing, the, the next slide we got here, first I'm, I'm reminding you that this field not only had bean leaf beetles at a pretty healthy number, by the way, that's 40 per 25 sweeps, 
So if we were comparing it back to like, like Kelly's survey, that was per 100 sweeps, that would have been what? Eh, close to 200, something like that. It's a lot, like it's a lot of beetles when you're, every time you're sweeping that net, you're getting almost two beetles, right? In addition, we had pretty close to, to one green clover worm per sweep in our untreated plots. It's pretty high insect population. Here's the yield data. It's the untreated over here. And, and by the way, there's not an effect there, okay? This isn't a statistical difference. These were the same. Part of the reason we do these statistics, right, there's a lot of variability, plot-to-plot -plot variability in yield. In this case, not only was the effect of insects on yield not larger than the, the variability that's out there, there wasn't one. And that's with a very high population of these defoliating insects. This is the reason why we, we, we can't stress enough, the, these plants can take a lot of defoliation before we get that injury. So again, how much is a lot? Before R3, 30% defoliation. Anyone in here ever seen 30% defoliation? It's going to catch your eye, okay? If you've got economically damaging defoliation before bloom, you're going to know it if you're anywhere close to that field at all. We've lowered these uh, recently based on updated soybean prices um, and yield potentials. So we go with a 10% from R3 to R5. That's when it's the most sensitive. One thing to keep in mind, R3 to R5 is not when we see these defoliating insects most of the time, right? So that's when the plant is most sensitive to that injury. It's not necessarily when we're seeing a lot of that injury occurring. We increase it a little bit at R6, up to 15%, which is a lot. Um, that's a picture of 15% over on the right. It's a lot, it looks pretty bad. Um, and then at R7, you can walk away from it. You know, when those leaves start to yellow and fall off, well, probably controlling a defoliating insect at that stage doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Um, da down in, in Arkansas, every once in a while, they use a defoliant down there for uh, soybeans a lot of times. Every once in a while, you get a question of if I should mix an insecticide in with the defoliant. <laughs> no, no, you shouldn't mix it in with the defoliant. <laughs> we didn't get those questions often, by the way. But, you know, every once in a while, every once in a while, you get some, some interesting ones. We're, we're pretty confident that at that point, we don't have much to gain from protecting that. One thing to keep in mind with that pod feeding, okay, and you've got you to be sure you know your bean leaf beetle feeding from like corn earworm feeding. Corn earworm, which we don't get very often, they're feeding directly on the seed. That's a problem, right? That's direct yield loss. Your threshold for corn earworm would be a lot lower than what it is for bean leaf beetle scarring the pods, which some of the time, allows that moisture to get into the pod. That's why it's high. It's around 10% of pods scarred. You go a little more aggressive than that if it's happening earlier. Um, but that's not saying 10% of seeds are getting injured, right? That would be a problem. That's saying 10% of the pods are getting scarred. Some lower percentage of those seeds are suffering quality issues because of that. Um, and again, not something we see consistently, not something we see across farms. Just showed you the data from when we have a very high population of bean leaf beetles in our fields. Uh, we did not see a yield impact from that. So just something to keep in mind. Um, and with that, I think I left plenty of time. Um, sometimes I do that. <laughs> sometimes I get the timing right. Uh, I think we'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Yes? Yeah, good point. And the question was if any of our data are with two modes of action at R3. Not in this trial. Uh, we've done some of that before. It does last longer. It's not going to carry you from R3 to the end of the season, but it does last longer when you have like a, one of those products with a neonic mixed in. Um, so it'll be longer than five to seven days, but it's not going to be 30 days. Yes.
Yeah, the, the question is if there's anything new on integrated refuge for western corn rootworm. On the corn rootworm side, not at this time. It's still a 5% in the bag refuge for that insect if you've got a pyramided BT hybrid, which all of our BT hybrids are, are pyramided. Um, the new RNAi products that are coming in, they're also coming in at a 5% integrated refuge. There's talk about changing some of that for above ground pests, particularly in the southern United States. There hasn't been a lot of talk about doing that in the Midwestern US at this point. The general feel that I get, and I'm not a like resistance modeler type person, I, I don't do that kind of work. The feel that I get from my colleagues who are is that the integrated refuge, although a lot of them will say 5% is probably not enough to effectively mitigate resistance, but they'll say with rootworm, an integrated refuge is probably better than a block refuge because of the way that insect behaves um, and because of the issues with compliance when we go with a block refuge. With the above ground insects, with the caterpillar pests, the block refuge is superior if compliance were not an issue. So if we always had that block refuge, then that block refuge would be superior for all of our above ground insects or at least all the ones that I know of. Yeah, good question. Um, any other Questions? Is European corn borer included on any surveys? Um, the question is, is European corn borer included in any surveys? We used to do a, a stock survey in the fall, and that ended in several years ago, many, many years ago, because of not being able to pick anything up because of um, all the new traits. We um, do do a monitoring program, um, trapping. We do black cut worm and true army worm in the spring, and then we transition to earworm, fall army worm, and corn borer um, during the summer. We do have corn borer traps out. Um, we rarely catch corn borer in a trap. <laughs> so we try, but we have not had any luck lately. And so populations overall seem to be low, although we do get um, sporadic calls throughout the growing season of um, infestations of corn borer in non-traded, non-GMO focused areas. Oh yeah, we can talk, we can talk about gall midge. We can talk about gall midge. Um, so gall midge is an invasive soybean pest. We think it's invasive. It's sort of new to science out in Nebraska and Iowa. Uh, it's something we've, Kelly and I have both been surveying for, and I've been doing kind of a focused survey up along the border uh, with Iowa, basically from, um, you know, the middle of the state uh, all the way up to northwestern Illinois. You've been searching for it in, in all of your fields, right, um, this gallmage. We haven't found it. Um, when we do find it, if we do find it, you'll hear about it. <laughs> like, it, it, it's not going to be a, uh, a secret if we find it in Illinois. But we haven't found it so far. My impression, talking to my colleagues out in Nebraska, is that it's not moving terribly fast. Like, they keep finding it in new places, but it's mostly because they're looking for it. Like, as you might imagine, since no one knew this thing existed, like, six, seven years ago, their, you know, a lot of their efforts on it have really picked up. And so the closest it is, is like, oh, it's kind of in central Iowa, but those areas in central Iowa where they found it, it's not like a pest there. They just, they, they found it. Like they started looking for it and they found it. Where it's really impacting yield heavily is on the, the eastern border of Nebraska and the western border of Iowa. And it seems like it's fairly limited to that geography as a, like as a major yield impacting pest. Personally, I kind of hope it stays there because it's not fun to deal with. Um, it's been a pretty serious problem for those farmers, but it's a relatively small acreage where they're really fighting it like as a major issue. Any other any other questions? Yeah. 
have they figured out how to treat it if it is a problem? So most of the mechanisms they've found to treat it so far aren't methods that we're really going to necessarily like. Okay, so they're doing some work with hilling like you would do with potatoes, you know, where you, you hill soil up on the base of the stem. It enters through the base of the stem. That actually seems to be pretty effective. And for those guys who are really struggling with this thing, it's worthwhile. They've tried chemicals. The only one I think they've gotten good efficacy from, was, I think it was Furidan. Uh, yeah, yeah, I hear a few snickers at that. Some of you remember what Furidan is, right? It's been a while since we used that one. Um, it's not an easy insect to kill, apparently. And, and part of the issue, so like the adults, it's like hessian fly. It's the same um, family as hessian flies. So the adults are these little cryptic tiny flies. Uh, they have a hard time even monitoring those adults. So you can't really get control of the adults because they don't know where they are or really how long they're flying or anything like that. Those larvae then are feeding on the inside of the plant. So you would think maybe like a systemic insecticide would control them, um, but apparently with the, the systemic insecticides we have available to us in soybean, uh, they haven't gotten adequate control from that, from like the, the seed treatments, for instance. And those are the two methods I know of that have gotten effective control for them. It, so they're, they're really, again, they're struggling with it, but there's also like a lot about even just the very basic biology that they don't know because it is brand new. Any other, other questions? If not, all right. Yeah, sure thing. All right, let's give Kelly and Nick a round of applause. Great session.